into a lesson here. And obviously we've been going through the book of Acts and I hope that you've been encouraged. And we're going to look at a few verses in Acts chapter 11. And I'm going to ask Marvin uh, to be active on the chat on this Zoom call to make sure that he writes out the uh, scriptures that we're going to go through because we're going to go at a pretty good clip. We're going to go kind of fast. And I have um, all of the scriptures kind of written down on my paper, my lesson plan here. So uh, I'm going to read most of those scriptures from this, this paper. So if you can keep up, get to the scriptures in the Bible. If not, uh, make sure you, you write them down and then you can go back and study them on your own. But the title of the lesson is Evidence of the Grace of God. So turn over to Acts chapter 11. We're going to look at the evidence of the grace of God and what that means. Acts chapter 11, and it's in verse 19 that we'll pick it up. And it says, now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turn to the Lord. This is incredible because it references what happened in Acts chapter 8 when there was a scattering as a result of the persecution that broke out against the church. And of course, that persecution began in earnest with the martyrdom, or rather the murder of Stephen, the first Christian martyr uh, in the Bible. And Paul was there essentially overseeing uh, the stoning of Stephen, and then this persecution breaks out and then all of the disciples are scattered while the apostles remained in Jerusalem. And it's important to understand and remember what we established last week is that this scattering was not because they were afraid, because his disciples were not afraid of persecution, were not afraid of uh, even uh, you know, a physical threat, um, because we know in whom we believe. Amen. Uh, and we know that at the end of the day, this life is temporary, and ultimately we are looking for our home in heaven and not our home here on earth. So it references, again, those who had been scattered. Now, we talked about it last week that that word scatter in the Greek is diaspora. So it's it's really, it's a spreading out, a uh, scattering, and it's a term that would be used in agriculture, uh, kind of in the idea of like scattering seeds or sowing seed. So they were scattered, these disciples all over uh, the kind of outer reaches of Israel there. But what were they doing? They were sowing the seed. They were preaching the word of God. The disciples, it says in verse 19, were spreading the word. Amen. So this is really incredible. And I think for us, it's important to understand that every disciple is a disciple maker. That as a disciple of Jesus, just like Alex shared, and just like Maciel shared, uh, we believe that God has called each and every one of us through the scriptures to not just be a recipient of the gospel, but to be a preacher of the gospel. That our commission, that our call, that our duty, our service to God is to go out and to spread the word and to be active in sharing our faith and, and to learn how to do that effectively. Is it easy? No, it's not easy but it is necessary and it's awesome. It's an incredible uh, adventure that God has put us on as disciples. As a disciple of Jesus, our priority is to spread the word and make disciples. Can I get an amen? Amen. Uh, you know, verse 20, you know, it's interesting. It says that, that the message had been spread in verse 19, but only to Jews. In verse 20, it says some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began speaking to Greeks also. This is a little dangerous. You know, if you go back and read Acts chapter 10, we find Peter converting Cornelius, who was the first non-Jew convert in the first century church, okay? So there were other uh, Greeks, but that had been converted to Judaism, and they were essentially Jewish in their religion, but then they became Christians, right? But this guy, uh, for example, the Ethiopian eunuch, he was a, what was called a proselyte Jew. He wasn't ethnically Jewish, but he was uh, Jewish according to the way he worshiped God. This guy, Cornelius, was a Gentile, 
uh, and he hadn't converted to Judaism, but he did worship God and he loved God. And he was devoted. But this is a big deal uh, that happened there in Acts chapter 10. But just for time's sake, we're not going to get into all of that today. Uh, but these people here in Cyprus and um, and Cyrene, were they were separate. You know, they were not uh, with Cornelius when he was converted. And of course, uh, back then, they didn't have Snapchat and Instagram, so they didn't know what was going on in any particular city that they were not obviously present at, uh, they themselves. So even though Cornelius had already been baptized, these guys had the audacity to preach not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And I think it's incredible because uh, what that teaches us is that these men, these disciples, they were not afraid. And as disciples, we are not afraid. Uh, and I think that we would all say amen to that. Like, we're not afraid of the world and we're not afraid of any pushback or any repercussion. But I think sometimes we can be afraid of making mistakes. I think sometimes we can be afraid of what our leaders might think. I think sometimes we can be afraid of failure. But these guys, they were not afraid. They went after it. They, they took initiative and they did something that Honestly, many people would even frown upon to say like, hey, you're not supposed to be preaching to the Gentiles. This is a Jewish religion. That's how many people viewed it in the first decade of Christianity. After all, for the first seven years, uh, the only Christians were, were Jews. But now we see that there are Gentiles being converted. And I think it's a, a, a call higher for us to be people, the sort of people who take initiative to be the sort of people who start something, to be the sort of people who maybe get into a little bit of spiritual trouble. You see what I'm saying? Maybe you ruffle some feathers. Maybe uh, you, you, you know, maybe you can, you great people sometimes, but you're somebody who wants to do what is right for God. And you're not waiting for somebody to tell you what to do or how to do it. Amen. In verse 21, it says that the Lord's hand was with them and they want a great number of people. And uh, I just think that that's so incredible. The Lord's hand was with them. God was working with them. And that's what made them effective in winning many disciples. Mark 16, verse 20, at the end, we know what it says uh, in the Great Commission where Jesus sends them out to preach to every creature. He goes, he says, hey, you got to go into all the nations and preach to everybody. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who reject the message will not. And at the end of that, in verse 20, it says the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. I just think that's so incredible. They were sent out, but then God really did uh, follow through on his promise. We know what it says in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, go make disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey everything, and surely I will be with you. We see that happen according to Mark 16, where it says the Lord was with them. And then here in Acts chapter 11, the hand of the Lord was with the brothers and the sisters. And that's why they grew in such a tremendous way. It was awesome to see uh, the Good News Network episode six, you know, to see what's happening in Texas, in Dallas. Uh, they had, a, I think it was a, a, a two week goal to have 100 studies. And in two days, they had 102 studies. I mean, the Lord, uh, the hand of the Lord is with them. In Houston, they had 104 studies. And God is just moving. That's just one small example of what God is doing all around the world. And it's inspiring for us to know that, hey, if we're walking with God, if we're close to him, we're going to see incredible results because of his grace. Let's pick it up here in verse 22 of Acts 11. It says, news of this reached the ears of the church of Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived there and saw the evidence of the grace of God, or in your version, it might say what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people brought were brought to the Lord. And here we talk about what the grace of God has done or what the evidence uh, of the grace of God had shown. And I want us to focus in really quickly on what the grace of God can accomplish in your life and what it does accomplish in the life of the disciples. Number one, the grace of God, it saves us. Ephesians chapter two, verse one to ten says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins 
in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The grace of God saves us. And it's incredible because it talks about being dead in your transgressions and sins, uh, being an object of wrath or, or rather deserving punishment. You deserve wrath. You know, Maciel talked about it where you just feel so trapped by your sin. And the more you try to change, the further down you go. Uh, you know, it, it is like a slimy pit. David talks about being lifted out of the pit of muck and mire. And it's like you, you can't ever find a foothold. You can't ever get a grip. And things just continue to get worse and things continue to get darker. And sin always escalates. Nothing in life stays uh, the same. Everything either grows or dies. And if you're in sin, it's going to take you further than you want to go. And, and all of us can relate to that, where we said, hey, man, we, we, we were flirting with the line. We were, uh, we were in a little bit of sin. And then all of a sudden, that sin took us further than we, went, we wanted to go. It was more than we bargained for. Uh, and it keeps us longer than we wanted to stay. And it costs more than we want to pay. And that's true for me. And it's true for all of us. And we can all share with you just the level of sin that we were in before the grace of God uh, came in and saved us. And, and what that means is that we can never merit our salvation or earn our salvation or be good enough for our salvation. Uh, we, we blew that chance once we sinned. Amen. Uh, this is not to divorce obedience from salvation. You must obey. You must submit to the word of God to be saved. Uh, but we understand just the fact that we're alive is a grace of God. Uh, just the fact that, you know, and, and we get not just uh, our salvation, but we get to enjoy the, the kingdom of God. And it's, it's awesome to have a purpose in our lives. It's awesome to have a mission. And it's awesome to have the incredible family that we have. So what is the grace of God? What does it do? What's the evidence? It saves us. Number two, it commissions us. Look at uh, Ephesians 3, verse 7. It says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people. This grace was given me to preach the, to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages was uh, past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, through faith, uh, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. You know, it's incredible here because it says that the grace of God has given us uh, the gift of administration. It's given us this role. It's commissioned us. We've been given a task to accomplish, and we've been sent out by the Holy Spirit. And again, this is a call for us to take initiative, uh, to be brave and confident, to not be afraid to make mistakes and to paint in broad strokes with bright colors. And what that means is that we've all got to learn how to study the Bible with people and how to convert people. Um, I, I really do believe that this is the ticket and that this is what the scriptures call us to. Uh, now, some of us, I think, may not see ourselves in that way. Maybe we think, no, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I know that we all can start to struggle with, with I don't know, I would, I would call it just self-abasement. We, we, we lack confidence. Uh, but, but to lack confidence is a prideful position because we've got to remember that the grace of God has commissioned us and has sent us out. 
Remember that when you've been commissioned, you don't need permission. Amen. Uh, God has called each of us to go out and to make disciples. Number three, it teaches us. Titus chapter two, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. It teaches us. It says the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness, to say no to worldly passions, but to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Are you guys with me? And this is a great question to pose to yourself. Am I teachable? How well do I handle discipling? How well do I handle scrutiny? How well do I handle criticism? And those that desire to grow will invite discipling and will invite criticism because that's what's going to keep us on the straight and narrow. And it's the grace of God that teaches us to say no to those things that are going to ruin our lives and ultimately get in the way of accomplishing God's will. Number four, it motivates us. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 to 10. For I'm the least of the apostles, this is Paul, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You know, Paul's motivation for all of the hard work and all of the effort and all of the sacrifice was the grace of God. It was just simply him remembering that he was who he was before he became a disciple. He was the guy that oversaw the murder of the first Christian martyr. He was the guy that was going in and remember he was banging on people's houses and dragging away men, not just the men and the women. I mean, this guy was ruthless in his persecution of the church. He was vehemently opposed to God's church and wanted to destroy it. Uh, in no uncertain terms, said, that's who I was. But then Jesus knocked me off my horse. You remember that? When you were in the world, riding high and mighty, and Jesus came and knocked you down. He says, I'll never forget that time. Uh, and it was so cool to hear uh, Alex share about, you know, the seeking God study and the kingdom study. And, you know, now he's blessed and he knows what that means. It means to be super happy, amen. And, and you'll never forget the, those Bible studies. You'll never forget your conversion where you said, man, I was, I, was, I was addicted. I was addicted to drugs and alcohol or to uh, pornography and masturbation and to all kinds of dark and wicked things or consumed with what people thought about me, consumed with my own self-image, uh, you know, uh, full of greed. I uh, had no time for God, had no time for my family. And Jesus comes and knocks us off of our horse. And Paul says, listen, I remember that. I remember that I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be alive, let alone to be saved. And, and then even further to have a mission. He says, that's what motivates me. Uh, I don't know who Paul's Bible talk leader was. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it was like somebody like Chris Jones. Uh, I'm not sure who his discipler was. Uh, but we know that those men that were involved in his life were not his motivation. They would be a weak motivation compared to the grace of God. It's the grace of God. It's our remembrance that who we were before we became disciples and who we are now because of Jesus. How hard you work for the Lord is directly proportional to how grateful you are for the blood of Jesus. I thought that Marley and Christine did a great job. And one of the things I really appreciated about him was just the, the fact like giving to God is a part of your Christianity. And there's two indicators really that, that show us where our hearts are and show us how grateful we are. And it's, it's the way we deal with our two most valuable resources. Number one, our time. And number two, our money. And, and God doesn't need our money. Amen, guys. Uh, it, the Bible says that the silver and the gold are his. Uh, you know, he knows where all the buried treasure is in the Bermuda Triangle. He, he doesn't need what we give. Amen. The church does need it. So please continue to give. Uh, uh, but but it's, it's a test of the heart. And it shows us 
where we're at. And uh, evangelism, how we spend our time in working for God and in advancing his kingdom is one of the most important factors of, of what we do as Christians. And if a church becomes lukewarm or when a church becomes lukewarm, the first two things that start to uh, go are the evangelism and the financial sacrifice, the giving, because those are the things that are hard to keep up because all of us at the end of the day struggle with a little bit of selfishness. And uh, I appreciate Tanya being so vulnerable where she says, Hey man, listen, I, I was dependent on my flesh I was, and what does that mean? You know, subtitles, because I can totally relate. I was just thinking about myself all the time. And I was like, man, I was really convicted. Uh, you, you start to think about all of your inadequacies. You start to think about uh, all of your challenges or all of your problems. And you forget that what God has called you to do is to make disciples, to be a fisher of men and to make other fishers of men, to go out there and impact the world that is lost and is hurting. And there are so many people. If I told you, because sometimes people can feel like, you know, we talk about evangelism too much. But if I told you that out today at Walmart or at the mall or somewhere in your neighborhood, somewhere where you live, there are a few people that you're going to reach out to that that will literally never ever forget you because of the impact that you'll have in their lives. Because this morning they were praying for somebody or something to happen so that they could find God. If I told you that the fifth person you share with today was going to become an incredible disciple, just this like undaunted, unfettered, just ball of energy, fired up, game changing young man or young woman who would go and be a missionary and lead churches all over the world, just like Alex and Maciel, amen? If I told you the fifth person who you shared your faith with was that person and they'd get baptized in a few days, would you think I was talking about evangelism too much? Or would you be excited to go out and make it happen? Because we can't talk about evangelism enough. And here's the other reality. I could talk about evangelism until I'm blue in the face, but it's not until you're in touch with the grace of God that you're actually going to go out and do it. Amen? Because ultimately, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but a matter of power. And it's great to highlight each Bible talk. If you look at Chris and Vin, Chris and Vin are great disciples, but they can't motivate Jay and Tanya or Marley and Christine or Samantha or Alina. Or they, can't, they are not enough. They are awesome but they're not enough. Uh, and that's the difference I believe between the kingdom and the religious world is that we believe each disciple is personally responsible and personally accountable for all things done while here on earth. And that, and that's, that's challenging, but I view it as very inspiring because God has not, not only called me to do it, but has given me the opportunity. Uh, I get to partake in the mission and the Lord's hand is with us. God is working with us. You know, I've been privileged because I've actually worked for my dad and um, he's a good boss. Amen. Uh, but uh, he was always up before me. He was always working harder. He was always prepping everything and that provided great confidence. And it also was inspiring. And God is out in the field before we ever arrive and he is working. He's sowing the seed. He's, he's, he's molding people. He's getting them ready for you and I, you know, we, we're not, we can't like, you know, we, we can't, I don't have any special magic powers and I don't think any of us do, but what we can do is we can share. We can open our mouths. We can, we can build relationships. We can give to people as we go. Uh, you know, yesterday I went to uh, Starbucks. Actually, my wife wanted to go to Starbucks. So since it was Valentine's Day, I said, amen, babe, let's go to Starbucks. And, um, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but as I was uh, going through the drive through and my wife got a, a tall uh, decaf pistachio latte and um, I got a dopio espresso and the kids got a couple of lemon loaves. Amen. And uh, as I was leaving, I, I paid and I shared my faith with him. He gave me his number. Amen. His name was Cameron. I don't, I don't think he's here today, sadly. Amen. Uh, it's something I got to check. I got to check my heart. Maybe I need to confess some sin. Uh, but as I was leaving, I said, all right, love you, man. And I was like, I just said, I love you to the barista. 
uh, ever happened to you as a disciple? You know, maybe you're talking to your boss and you say, okay, love you. And you're, and he's like, what? Okay. Uh, it, but it's, you know, we shared as we went and yesterday, Rachel and I, you know, just kind of on our, our, our day with the kids, we we're going around and Rachel, she really wanted to go to TJ Maxx. So I took her to TJ Maxx. Amen. And, uh, um, uh, you know, some of the influencers that she follows who do makeup said TJ Maxx has great makeup. I hope I didn't ruin her secret right there. Amen. Uh, and we, we got a number at TJ Maxx. Then we went to our favorite store, New Balance, because they have incredible uh, sales and uh, we just love it. And plus, you might go when you have a seven year old and a four year old, if you stay in the house uh, for longer than an hour, you're asking for trouble. So we just like drag them all over the place. And uh, we went to New Balance and we got a phone number there, a contact. And we went to uh, Starbucks and we got a phone number there. And it was a joy. It was fun. It was exciting uh, to be to partake and to work with the father. Uh, knowing that God is working in the lives of the people, it motivates us. Number five, the grace of God strengthens us. Second Timothy two, verse one is you then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The grace of God strengthens us. Uh, it builds us up when we know that at the end of the day, uh, our best efforts sometimes don't amount to much. Um, our, our talent can be limited. Our abilities maybe don't measure up, but the grace of God strengthens us. We know that even when we mess up, even when we've fallen, even when we've tripped up, we can stand again because of the grace of God. God loves us and he wants to be with us. Number six, it encourages us. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 16. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. To me, this is the highlight of the lesson. Second Thessalonians 2.16, it says that the grace of God gives us eternal encouragement, not temporary encouragement, not encouragement when things are going good, not encouragement only in your time of need, eternal encouragement, not just encouragement now, but encouragement forever. Are you encouraged this morning because of the grace of God this afternoon? Amen. Number seven, it emboldens us. Hebrews 4 verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God's grace emboldens us. God's grace makes us confident. God's grace can erase your fears of what other people think about what you're doing. God's grace can erase your fears of failure. God's grace can erase your shame and know that God wants you to approach his throne with confidence and reverence. Finally, number eight, it grows us. Colossians chapter one, verse six, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You know, God's grace grows us, and it's by the grace of God that this year the movement will become 10,000 for the Lord, 10,000 strong. Amen? You know, we know what uh, Acts 11, verse 25, 26 says, where the disciples are called Christians first at Antioch. Disciple equals Christian equals saved. you got to be a disciple to be saved. You've got to obey the Bible to be a disciple. Amen. And every disciple is a teacher. Look at Acts 11, verse 25. It says, And Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I want to put a phrase before us. And the phrase is, see one, do one, teach one. I'm just going to be open about where I got that phrase from. I did not invent it. I got it from watching ER. Okay. It's the first season of ER from 1994. I was nine years old. Anthony was like 35. Um, and I was watching this episode of ER 
And uh, there's this young doctor who has to do stitches and he's never done stitches before. And he's freaking out. I mean, he's like, he's really worried. He's like, I don't think I can do it. I just don't, I don't have the confidence. You ever feel like that? Maybe your Bible talk leader asks you to lead the study. Or maybe you've set up a study and nobody else can come. Or maybe you set up to go share your faith and nobody else can come. And there you are by yourself on campus. And, and here this young doctor, he's got to do these stitches. and He just doesn't have the confidence. So then, uh, you know, he's able to watch another doctor do it one time. And then the next person that needs uh, sutrases comes in again, he needs stitches. And then the doctor, the presiding resident says, see one, do one, teach one. You see it done one time, that's enough. Now you do one. And after you do one, then you can teach one. And that's when you really know what to do. After you've seen it, then you've done it. And now you teach it. And the Bible calls every disciple to be a teacher. We can never divorce obedience from salvation. You've got to obey the word of God. The word of God is our final and ultimate judge. I want to leave you with one final Psalm in chapter 19, verse seven to 11. Psalm chapter 19. You know, Solomon says of making many books, uh, there, there's, you know, there are many, many books <laughs> and to read them all is exhausting. Uh, but really, we only need one. In Psalm chapter 19, in verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. You know, I want to challenge us to read our Bibles more than we ever have. Kip challenged the Crown of Thorns Council to read the Bible through in a year. I want to challenge all of us to read the Bible through in a year because the Bible, the word of God is flawless. It brings light to the eyes. It enlightens the heart. It gives us judgment. It, it, it gladdens us. And it says that we're warned by them and in keeping them, there is much reward. And uh, reading is a muscle. Learning is an exercise. And the more you do it, the stronger you will be. And don't ever forget that readers are leaders. But this is what I really want us to remember today. You see one, do one, teach one, and to God be the glory. Amen. Amen.